Welcome everyone. Welcome to our session on sex, prep, and healthcare access among gay, bisexual, and queer men. We're going to be presenting findings from the Engage COVID sub-study. Um, I am Shana Sparling. I am a postdoctoral fellow at X University, and I'm also the national team manager for the Engage study. So in this session, we're going to be sharing preliminary findings from our ongoing mixed method study investigating the psychological and biobehavioral impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on gay, bisexual, queer, and other men who have sex with men in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Our panel today is going to focus on five main areas, COVID risk and testing experiences, mental health and substance use, the impact of COVID on work, and changes in healthcare service access, including access to and use of PrEP. This session is going to last from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, it will begin by with the land acknowledgement, introduction of our panelists, um, and then we will go into uh, the presentations, followed by a live Q&A and discussion. Um, before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. First, CBRC has established some community guidelines for the summit to help ensure a safe, respectful, and inclusive experience for everyone. This includes respecting personal experiences and ensuring that we are a, uh, sharing this space with other participants. Uh, you can refer to the Summit 2021 page on the CBRC website for, for more information on these guidelines for participation. We understand that some of the content and discussions might be difficult to hear and encourage any participant in need to access our counseling support. On the Summit Participant director, Directory located on the conference platform, a counseling coordinator will be listed. The coordinator will help connect you with a counselor for an informal active listening and supportive session. We encourage folks to post, post their questions or their comments in the chat box, but we will be holding all audience questions until after the panelists' presentations and, and after our discussant. Um, please also be aware that there will be automated closed captioning available in both English and French. And lastly, we are already, well, not me, <laughs> the CBRC, is uh, recording today's session, which will be published within a couple of days on this platform. So we ask that you refrain from recording today's session yourself. At the end of the session, you're welcome to share your feedback using the evaluation form, which will be available when you scroll down the page and select the evaluations button. So I'm coming to you from Toronto, which is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the uh, Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples and Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, we have Daniel Grace, who is an associate professor at the Dalalana School of Public Health um, in Toronto at U of T. We also have Jordan Sang, a CTN postdoctoral fellow based at the BC Center for Excellence in HIV Research. We have uh, Melada, Melada, I'm so sorry, your last name. Dvorakova. Milada Dvorkova, I should have practiced it with you, I'm sorry, um, who is a research coordinator with the Montreal Engage team. We have Cornell Gray, a postdoctoral fellow based at the Dalalana School of Public Health. And our discussant is Ryan Tran. He's the manager of education and outreach at the Asian Community AIDS Services in Toronto. So um, Jose, if it's okay, I'm going to hand things over to begin the video portion of our presentation. It's my pleasure to open up today's panel, during which time we'll provide preliminary findings from Engage COVID-19. I'll provide a quick introduction to some of our qualitative and quantitative results before turning things over to my fellow panelists who will provide in-depth overviews of study findings related to COVID-19 testing, PrEP access, and experiences of racism during the pandemic. We're covering a lot of ground today, so if you have any questions about our ongoing work, please do reach out. Our research is only possible because of an incredible group of community partners, researchers, trainees, and volunteers from across Canada. We're grateful to our funders and, of course, our study participants for making this work possible. Engage is a mixed methods cohort study conducted in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. We recruited cisgender and transgender men who reported having sex with another man in the past six months. Participants completed a questionnaire in French or English and HIV and STI testing. You can see here the total baseline sample recruited in each city. 
We work with community engagement committees across Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. And the work we're describing today, our COVID-19 research, was embedded within this ongoing study cohort. Engage COVID-19 seeks to document COVID-19 infection, immunity, and related determinants among gay and bisexual men to examine how this population perceives and is impacted by measures to curb the spread of the disease. We wanted to know how COVID-19 was impacting our communities in the short and long term. We're using a mixed methods approach, a quantitative questions and qualitative interviews, to understand how the pandemic is impacting GVM in terms of uptake and implementation of COVID-19 messages and the interrelated impacts of COVID-19 on sexual behaviors and access to HIV and STI testing, treatment and prevention like PrEP, which we'll talk about later today, mental health outcomes and substance use patterns. Our panel today will speak to both biomedical aspects of our research and behavioral and psychosocial aspects we're beginning to learn about through surveys and qualitative interviews. Between November 2020 and October 2021, we conducted 92 in-depth qualitative interviews. We purposively recruited from the Engage cohort in two rounds. 67% of our qualitative sample identified um, as BIPOC. GBM were asked questions regarding the impact of COVID-19 on their sexual and social lives. Over time, we iteratively refined the guide to ask additional questions in our second round. This included questions about vaccine uptake, hesitancy, and variants of concern. Some additional details on study methods and sociodemographics will be noted in the presentations that follow. 1,248 participants completed our first COVID-19 study module between September 2020 and May 2021. The majority of HIV negative participants were 30 to 44 years old, while nearly two thirds of participants living with HIV were 45 years old or older. The majority of participants living with HIV lived alone. HIV negative participants were more likely not to live alone. Over 80% of participants, regardless of zero status, identified as gay, and 73% of the sample was white. Income varied in the sample with 38 percent making under 30,000 a year and 35 making between 30 to 60,000 per year. 70% of participants had a bachelor's degree or higher. The majority of participants reported a decrease in the frequency of in-person sexual activities when compared to pre-COVID-19. Across cities, 73% of participants reported less or much less sex with guys from outside of their household during the first wave of the pandemic when compared to before COVID-19. 22% reported about the same amount of sex. Across cities, 70% reported less or much less group sex, with about 26% reporting about the same. Conversely, participants reported increased engagement in physically distanced sexual activities, more camming, sexting, and solo masturbation. If we turn to the qualitative findings, we can see here how COVID-19 had wide-ranging impacts on GBM's sexual behaviors. Some GBM described limiting interactions by closing open relationships. Other GBM formed new sexual bubbles, for example, for example, forming small networks of trusted partners. Some participants who engaged in casual sex incorporated COVID-19 safety precautions by practicing socially distanced sex and outdoor sex. Others have worn masks and avoided kissing when hooking up. Finally, some of our participants described that they completely abstained from having sex during this stage of the pandemic. If we return to the quantitative findings on mental health, we can see that work-related stress was the most uh, given answer across the whole sample and among HIV negative participants. Feeling trapped or loss of freedom was the most commonly given as the primary source of stress among participants living with HIV. 
Most HIV negative participants reported a worsening of their mental health, while a smaller proportion of those living with HIV reported worsening. Perhaps not surprisingly, the worse participants pre-pandemic mental health, the more likely they were to experience worsening mental health during the pandemic. That is, participants who reported their pre-pandemic mental health as excellent were more likely to report no change during the pandemic. Most men we interviewed reported that the COVID-19 pandemic had negative impacts on their mental health in our qualitative interviews. Some described that COVID-19 has brought about depression, anxiety, stress, loneliness, and sadness, as these quotes illustrate. My stress levels are high. It's affecting my relationship, affecting all of my relationships, not just my partner, but all of my relationships. Returning to our quantitative findings, Substance use increased across all substance categories, cities, and serostatuses, but differed by risk groups for different substances. While I can't do justice to this data in this short presentation, we can begin to see some of these trends. For example, alcohol use grew by participants who were at low risk or no risk uh, prior to the pandemic. We saw the greatest increase in alcohol use. This is the kind of substance that had the greatest growth, while opioid use, uh, use had the lowest growth. Cannabis and hallucinogen use increased among participants who were at moderate risk use, and amphetamine use grew only among pre-pandemic low uh, or no risk participants and high risk participants. Now turning to the qualitative, we can see that some GVM also in this sample reported that the COVID-19 lockdown measures resulted in an increased use of alcohol and other substances. Depression, stress, anxiety, and boredom caused by the pandemic led to increased alcohol and cannabis consumption for some GVM. Others shared that decreasing their substance use, mainly for mental health reasons and changes of lifestyle, or that their substance use remained relatively consistent. HIV negative participants were more likely to report avoiding using health services because of COVID-19 concerns. Dental care and family doctors were the most impacted healthcare services. Harm reduction services were the least impacted. Many participants commented that scheduling appointments, HIV and STI testing, regular doctor visits, in person was difficult or impossible. Some participants reported that having medical tests delayed or canceled. And COVID-19 has also negatively impacted the health of trans participants who across cities explained that their gender affirming surgeries had been postponed since they were not considered quote unquote emergency surgeries. And finally, access to mental health uh, services were also impacted by COVID-19. Participants had mixed responses when discussing the move to virtual care models, including virtual mental health supports. For some, online care was much more convenient, and for others, it simply did not meet their needs. We're continuing to examine the long-term implications of these findings, including their implications for service delivery and online models of care. My colleagues will now provide more in-depth reviews of our data in the presentations that follow. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming uh, to my chat today. My name is Milada Dvorakova, and I'm a research coordinator for the Engage project in Montreal. Today, I'll be talking about our seroprevalence project, which is a component of the Engage COVID-19 substudy. In collaboration with a partnering lab in Ottawa, the serology analyses are currently underway and we don't have the results as of yet. So instead, today I'll be presenting work that was already approved in an analysis plan by the team whose names are listed below the study title here. I'll cover the rationale behind the study, some of the details of what we're doing, and also how the results may be useful. 
So in Canada, the spread of COVID-19 has been different over provinces and time. We've seen the differential impact of COVID-19 infections and been able to document it. In July 2021, StatCan released results from the Canadian COVID-19 Antibody and Health Survey to better understand the actual spread of the virus in the country by estimating how many Canadians have antibodies in their blood against the virus. The study found that SARS-CoV-2 antibody seroprevalence due to a past infection was higher in men compared to women. Uh, it was also higher in the age group of 1 to 19 years old, in visible minority Canadians compared to non-visible minority Canadians, and finally in Quebec compared to Ontario or BC. These results highlight the heterogeneity of the pandemic. And it's unknown whether this heterogeneity also applies to sexual minority men, such as gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, or GBM. Disparities in physical, mental, and sexual health in GBM may increase both risks for COVID-19 acquisition and related negative effects of infection, but we don't know. It's uncertain whether this context of higher health burden applies to COVID-19 as well. So for this reason, more information is needed to further characterize the disease among GBM while also examining associated factors like demographics, exposure contacts, and social determinants of health. So for this reason, our objectives for the seroprevalence arm of the Engage COVID-19 substudy were to ascertain COVID, um, sorry, to ascertain occurrence of COVID-19 by documenting SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence across Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver from March 2020 to April 2021. Uh, we also aim to characterize the clinical syndrome and related severity of both diagnosed cases and those having antibodies while considering HIV status. Finally, we aim to identify risk factors for COVID-19 acquisition, including sociodemographic and socioeconomic characteristics, uh, things like ethnicity, type of employment, financial strain, uh, along with behaviors. So things like COVID testing, sexual relations, and finally, uh, also potential exposure to COVID-19. So close contact with confirmed positive cases, or uh, even you know, international travel. So we'll use these results from uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibody testing coupled with COVID-19 specific survey questions. For this specific project, we're focusing on seroprevalence results and associated risk factors for COVID-19 using the first time point of the COVID-19 substudy module for which data was collected from September 16th, 2020 to April 30th, 2021, uh, in about 1,100 participants. And also a second time point is currently in progress. Antibody testing is being conducted among all participants at the Marc Langlois lab in the University of Ottawa. A bespoke assay analysis was chosen based on the latest seroepidemiological study protocol recommendations from the WHO and the CITF. The customized assay was used to detect IgG antibody response against three SARS-CoV-2 antigens. So spike, S, uh, receptor binding domain, RBD, and nucleocapsid, N. IgG is used because of its strong and prolonged level in serum following SARS-CoV-2 antigen exposure. And testing for three antigens and making serostatus calls based on at least two out of the three allows for higher sensitivity and specificity to SARS-CoV-2 exposure. It also allows us to limit the possibility of including cross-reactivity with other seasonal coronaviruses. And finally, and quite importantly, it allows us to discern between vaccine and naturally induced antibodies. So in addition to providing a serology sample, each participant completed an on-site or online COVID-19 specific questionnaire module, which was nested in the Engage Cohort Study Questionnaire using CASI software. The COVID-19 questionnaire module examined seven interrelated domains, which were described in the other presentations by my colleagues. But uh, something I will mention and something which makes our study unique is that the questionnaire allowed us to collect data on self-reported confirmed positive COVID-19 test results, vaccination status, and also self-reported disease severity. 
So this information is very useful to contextualize the serology data and also to serve as a way to cross-check results to derive seroprevalence. Once the serology results are finalized, we'll start with descriptive analyses and then we'll move to univariable and multivariable models to derive seroprevalence and associated risk factors. So while we don't have serology data to present yet, we can take a look at some of the variables from our questionnaire, which give us a better idea of potential exposure to COVID-19 in our population. A total of 1,279 participants completed the first COVID-19 time point module. Out of these, 742 were in Montreal, 213 in Toronto, and 324 in Vancouver. Out of the guys who completed this first time point, the greatest proportion reporting ever having had close contact with a confirmed positive COVID-19 case was seen in Montreal, followed by Toronto, and then Vancouver. While close contact with a confirmed case is of course not a proxy for seroprevalence, it's still interesting to see that the order of proportion magnitude per city complements what is seen in StatCan, with the highest seroprevalence being in Quebec, then Ontario, and then Vancouver. Symptoms in COVID tests don't follow this trend, however, in our data. Um, the highest proportion of guys experiencing any COVID-19 related symptoms since March 2020 was seen in Toronto at about 47%, followed by Vancouver and then Montreal. COVID-19 testing was interesting uh, as we have quite high proportions of our participants in all three cities reporting that they were tested for COVID-19 at least once with the highest proportion seen in Toronto, and then Montreal, and then Vancouver. So the exploration of other variables from our questionnaire is going to help us down the line to better understand these relationships and really see what's at play. Um, so finally, out of participants who reported undergoing a COVID-19 test, the highest proportion that reported actually receiving a confirmed positive COVID-19 result was seen in Montreal at about 5.4%, uh, followed by Toronto with a similar 4.72%, and then Vancouver at 1.3%. Once again, this relationship is complemented by the StatCan results, which is encouraging to see. Um, so you can probably see that while the questionnaire data can give us a general first idea of what seroprevalence may look like in our population, the serology analysis results are needed to give us the complete view, and this will include even participants who experience asymptomatic infections. So ultimately, we don't know how the COVID-19 pandemic affected Canadian GBM. Uh, while this population may not be in fact at greater risk for infection or adverse health outcomes, it's unknown since information on sexual orientation is not routinely collected in epidemiological investigations of COVID-19. With the seroprevalence study nested in ENGAGE, we hope to describe the actual level of exposure which GBM in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver have experienced to COVID-19. This will help in uncovering the potential dynamics of multiple epidemics in this population. For example, evidence regarding COVID-19 occurrence and disease severity and GBM living with HIV can help adapt efficacious behavioral HIV risk reduction preventions to the COVID-19 pandemic context. Not only this, but it will allow us to better understand where GBM fit into the wide range of COVID-19 experiences and risks among the general population. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan and today I'll be talking about the impacts of COVID-19 on PrEP use among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men using data from the Engage COVID-19 study. So a bit of background, pre-exposure prophylaxis, also called PrEP, is an effective prevention strategy for HIV-negative individuals and was approved by Health Canada in 2016. In multiple studies, it has been shown to be as high as 99% effective at reducing risk for HIV. However, there are a number of steps that individuals have to take to get onto PrEP. For example, individuals have to talk to the healthcare provider, they have to do tests for kidney functioning, as well as STI and HIV screening. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a multitude of psychological, social, behavioral, and structural effects, and these negative effects may have had a greater negative impact among GBM. <laughs> One such example is the closure of sexual health clinics in the first wave of the pandemic, which is a primary site of care and prevention for GBM. 
preliminary data collected from GBM in the Engage study found that about one-third of participants reported avoiding health services because of concerns about COVID-19 exposure. So the objective of this study is to use a mixed method approach to examine the impacts of COVID-19 on PrEP use among GBM in Engage. Additionally, in terms of background, it's important to look at PrEP trends pre-COVID-19. So the data comes from 2008 HIV negative unknown GBM, and the data is from February 2017 to March 2020. So importantly, what does this figure show is that PrEP has been increasing since February 2017 to March 2020 for all three cities, Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal, and overall. However, what's important to note here is that March 2020 is when the COVID-19 pandemic really started in Canada. So the data only goes up to March 2020. So it's we've yet to see the impacts of COVID-19 on PrEP use. So to briefly go over the methods here today, the results come from the Engage COVID-19 study, which is an ongoing mixed method study conducted in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal and began in September 2020. For the qualitative results, these come from 33 in-depth online interviews with HIV-negative GBM, and these interviews were conducted between November 2020 and February 2021. For the quantitative results, these come from the COVID-19 module, which was added to the Engage questionnaire in September 2020 when our sites reopened. The data presented here today is from September 2020 to April 2021, and there were 334 responses. So first, looking at our quantitative results for the impacts of COVID-19 on PrEP use, um, there's two important findings that we want to highlight here. The first is stop PrEP completely, and we have a total sample of 334 HIV-negative GBM, um, among which 21% indicated that they stopped PrEP because of COVID-19. Um, importantly, about 50% indicated that they were still taking their regular PrEP dosage and about 18% indicated that they had switched from continuous PrEP use to on-demand PrEP use. Another important finding we wanted to highlight was the other category, and this, in, this category included participants who indicated that they had wanted to start PrEP use, um, but they were unable to because of the pandemic. And so while these are descriptive data, um, we really want to use the opportunity to use uh, qualitative data to help illustrate perhaps why individuals stopped PrEP or perhaps why individuals were not able to start PrEP during the pandemic. So in terms of the qualitative results, we found a few key themes in the, our findings. So the first one is barriers to PrEP. So um, interviews from participants illuminated how um, there were a number of barriers um, to access PrEP that existed before the pandemic, such as insurance coverage, costs of PrEP, as well as finding a primary care provider. And what we get to a little bit later on is how these barriers may have been exemplified um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which made them even harder to access PrEP. So these interviews here are in relation to why individuals stop PrEP during COVID-19. And what we found was that uh, most GBM who stopped PrEP um, during the pandemic was related to a lack of perceived risk. And this is um, a more positive finding um, in the fact that these individuals stopped because they were at, um, at lower risk, um, whether or not their perception versus actual risk um, is aligned um, requires further analysis. But because these individuals indicated that they perceive themselves to be at lower risk, they decide to stop PrEP. And another uh, theme from our qualitative results um, was the difficulty navigating PrEP use um, during COVID-19. So a number of participants indicated difficulty um, getting access to PrEP, such as getting appointments um, and doing blood work and doing testing, um, all of which are requirements for PrEP um, because of the pandemic and restrictions um, of accessing healthcare sites. Additionally, um, a lot of visits were online and participants indicated a lack of personal connection with their healthcare provider, um, which they noted as important. Looking at our results, what does it all mean? Well, our findings indicate that COVID-19 has impacted PrEP use among GBM in Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. In our quantitative results, those indicate that they'd stopped PrEP completely was smallest in Vancouver and largest in Toronto. 
Conversely, those who indicate that they were still taking their PrEP doses regularly was largest in Vancouver and smallest in Toronto. And when looking at these numbers, it's important to consider other factors, such as different COVID-19 restrictions by provinces, as well as the epidemiology of COVID by province as well. So we know that Ontario and Quebec were the hardest hit by COVID in Canada. And Ontario had the longest lockdown in North America, as well, Quebec had implemented curfews for COVID restrictions, whereas restrictions in BC were relatively less. So perhaps that um, Ontario, with its greater restrictions, may be associated with greater PrEP discontinuation, and uh, less restrictions in BC may be associated with greater PrEP continuation. We hope to further research this in future studies. Additionally, looking at PrEP policy by province, BC and Vancouver is the only province to have freely um, available PrEP coverage, whereas participants in Toronto and Montreal may not be freely accessible to PrEP. When looking at our qualitative results, um, these highlight barriers to accessing PrEP, such as coverage cost, as well as finding a primary healthcare provider and reduced clinic hours. So looking at these results, these encourage for future health care um, delivery options, um, which may be less impacted by restrictions. An example of these include online delivery for PrEP. However, as we utilize more technology and look at future interventions, it's also important to note that participants indicated the importance of a healthcare connection and connecting with their healthcare provider um, in our interviews, and to keep this in mind as we consider future interventions. So the findings presented here today were based off of descriptive cross-sectional data. However, we're really interested in looking at the longitudinal impacts of COVID-19 beyond just descriptive data. So I want to highlight some future studies that we're working on. The first is a CTN postdoctoral fellowship, which is led by myself, and I'm looking at the effects of COVID-19 on influencing syndemic production, as well as the impacts of syndemics on PrEP and ART continu continuation, discontinuation, and reinitiation. Additionally, drawing on the qualitative and quantitative data presented here, our study team is analyzing the long-term impacts of COVID-19 on PrEP use, and this is being led by Dr. Daniel Gray. So I'll be taking you through some of the work we've been doing through the qualitative arm of the Engage COVID-19 study over the past year, specifically some of the findings from our first round of interviews. I'll be pointing to some of the ways that race showed up in the interviews we conducted with Engage COVID participants and how racism affected the lives of Asian and Black GBM in particular. As we know from previous epidemics, health crises disproportionately impact the lives of marginalized communities, including racialized communities, poor folks, and members of the LGBTQ2 community. Scientists have found that LGBTQ people of color are twice as likely to test positive for COVID-19 than their white counterparts, despite being more likely to adhere to COVID-19 prevention measures. Recent research has also uh, found that anti-Asian uh, racism has increased during the pandemic and Black people are twice as likely to be infected with COVID-19. So we conducted 42 in-depth qualitative interviews between November 2020 and February 2021. 13 participants were interviewed in Vancouver, 13 in Montreal, and 16 participants were interviewed in Toronto. 71%, 71% of our sample identified as racialized. I'll also point out that approximately 12% of our sample identified as Black and around 17% identified as East Asian. I'll be talking more about the experiences of these participants shortly. Participants in the Engage cohort study were recruited using purposive sampling to capture the diverse experiences of GBM. We wanted to ensure that there was representation across a number of key areas, including age, ethno-racial status, um, ethno-racial background, gender identity, and HIV status. Participants were asked questions regarding the impact of COVID-19 on their social and sexual lives during the first two weeks of the pandemic. Interviews were conducted virtually and coded in vivo using thematic analysis. We began our second round of interviews in June 2021. Uh, interviews were completed uh, at the beginning of October 2021, bringing our total to 93 across the three sites. Analysis for this second round of interviews is ongoing. 
for this particular paper, uh, we're using critical race theory as a lens to examine the experiences of GBM during COVID-19. Critical race theorists understand race as a culturally invented category rather than a marker of rather than a marker of biological difference. This framework maintains that racism is structural embedded within various institutions uh, that shape our society. It is through these institutions that racial hierarchies and social inequalities are preserved. When asked about their first encounters with COVID-19 related uh, information, participants described coming across news reports, conversations, and social media posts about a virus in China. This was later followed by descriptions of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus as the Chinese virus. Participants shared how they came across content containing conspiracy theories about how the virus was created in China, articles that pinned the source of the virus on the supposed unhygienic diet of Asian people, descriptions of Chinese people as quote unquote plague rats, the wide circulation of articles like these had a direct impact on how Asian GBM experienced COVID-19. As with this Montreal participant who recalls some of the racist experiences he had while online. The guys we interviewed were generally compliant in terms of following COVID, in terms of following public health guidelines, sorry. However, face masks represented more than a COVID-19 prevention tool. For some GBM, it was a marker of ethno-racial difference. The Toronto participant quoted here confesses that prior to COVID-19, he had associated the practice of wearing masks with Asian people and that face masks seemed unfriendly to him. Another white participant also described occasions prior to COVID-19 where he would make fun of folks who he read as being recent Asian immigrants. Fobs were the words, was the, was the term he used uh, for wearing masks. In both of these examples, face masks were effectively understood as un-Canadian. Asian GBM demonstrated an awareness of how their behaviors, that is wearing a face mask, and their identities, that is near race and ethnicity, might affect how they are treated in public. This Vancouver participant discussed an incident in which he was verbally assaulted by two white men while out in public. Asian GBM also shared examples where they were told to stay away from people on the train, keep their distance at work. Um, and in some of these cases, this was kind of couched in the language of social distancing, right? So you must stay off, stay, stay away um, because for you know someone's quote unquote safety, as it were. Over the past year, several stories have emerged that highlight the concerns of black men about being racially profiled while wearing a mask. Some black men believe that. Um, they experience more policing, more surveillance, more harassment where they, when they wear masks. This proved to be the case for the Vancouver participant quoted here. He was sitting outside his building when one of his neighbors, who knows who he is when his mask is off, came up to him and asked him what business he, he had being on the property. They told him to leave. His neighbor retreated once he confirmed his identity, but the participant went on to share his frustration about being harassed more during COVID-19, even though he's trying to do, in his words, the right thing um, by wearing his mask. In one of our, our round two interviews, actually, uh, Toronto participants shared that face masks make it more difficult for him to navigate predominantly white spaces because, because he is unable to make himself appear more friendly with the mask on, you know, so smiling and trying to um, appear less threatening. And this comes up in um, other stories that we've come across generally as well. Um, in, the, in the media. On a whole, white GBM in our study consider themselves as inclusive, if not outright anti-racist, with some participating in Black Lives Matter protests during the summer of 2020 and others critiquing the government for not doing more to support racialized and poor communities. Some GBM stated that they do not have enough information about the experiences of racialized communities during the pandemic. Others said that they did not think there was a difference because COVID affects everyone. Um, in their words, the, the, the virus does not discriminate. At the same time, participants drew on popular stereotypes about people of color when explaining how and why COVID-19 is spreading. So one participant blamed the virus on uh, quote unquote strength diets. Another blamed the spread on cultural values around masculinity. These assumptions about community behaviors are not new. 
Instead, they are being re-articulated during the pandemic to explain why particular racialized communities are being affected more than others. These racist encounters have had a negative impact on the health and Asian, the health of Asian and Black GBM. Participants described feeling stressed out by these incidents. They felt more isolated. Asian and Black GBMs over the experiences of racism also affected their relationship to healthcare institutions. One Asian participant felt some pressure to avoid getting COVID because he was concerned he would get less sympathy, less sympathy that doctors would think of him as a Chinese person with COVID and therefore treat him differently. A Black participant wondered if a nurse treated him a bit severely despite his attempts to be friendly because he was Black. Some participants also noted that their experience with healthcare institutions improved when they were accompanied by a white family member. So in closing, anti-Asian and anti-Black racism have been cultivated and normalized in Canada. The forms of racism detailed here are rooted in practices and histories that continue to mark racialized populations as second-class citizens and as others. Public health messaging has played a role in how participants engaged racialized communities throughout the pandemic. Moving forward, public health responses must address the specific forms of racism that people endure, along with the effects these racist, racist encounters have on the physical and mental health of people of color. As we can see from the presentations today, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant effect on the lives of GBM. In some cases, it has caused disruption to their sexual practices, changes to wellness practices, and, and increased exposure to racism. At the same time, COVID-19 has challenged GBM to redefine their relationships with sexual partners in ways that make them stronger and healthier, reconstructed their relationships with healthcare professionals through the provision of virtual care, and to reassess what community can and should look like in the wake of a major crisis. We look forward to developing our analysis over the next few months, and thank you for your time today. All right, great. Thank you. I was, well, thank you so much. I thought I enjoyed the videos. I hope everyone else did as well. Um, we're going to now go to Ryan Tran um, for uh, kind of a community perspective on the, the themes that were presented in the presentations we just saw. Thanks, Ryan. I'll leave it to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so my name is Ryan Tran. I use he, him pronouns, and I work as a manager of education and outreach at ACAS, or Asian Community Aid Services. And so we're a community-based aid service organization in Toronto, Ontario. And primarily, my work includes a lot of more frontline work with gay, bi, queer, East and Southeast Asian MSM here in Toronto. Um, so a lot of my experience is through what I hear through, uh, will be a lot from observations and I hear for, through my community, through the people I work with who are most, mostly HM and MSM. Um, so there were a lot of things in those videos and the presentations that we heard. And so some things I was, I guess some prominent things I see that relate to the work that I do. Um, largely because again how the impact of COVID on my community on the Asian MSM community uh, we see a lot of the mental health component um, of that for sure because of the um, a lot of like the financial instability or loss of work was mentioned but also where others had to continue working um, especially so especially with an Asian cultural lens we're going to see a lot of migrant workers um, who would be working who'd still have to work in the warehouse or grocery stores, um, frontline healthcare workers, a lot of them were Filipino as well. Um, so race does play a big part in how, like where, how people are working during the pandemic. Uh, on top of that, I was seeing a lot in our community about increased stress about immigration status, because at that time there would, um, there would be a lot of delays in whether they were trying to get their permanent residencies or their uh, visas were expiring. So there was a lot of uncertainty and stresses around what are they, what can these folks be doing? Uh, how do they, will they be able to stay in Canada? What, can, what do they need to do um, to stay? Or would they have to leave and pick up everything and go? So that was also a major stressor for my community. 
um we've also met i've heard about like people living having to move back to their family and that means whether some people are still in the closet or um especially with uh, students as well um others in terms of covid there was also a lot of fear with um anti-asian racism as well so um when people had to move back with their family there it was just you, you, you would hear it with, among the family members being having to take care of each other, be very cautious about going out um, and also just protecting each other with, um, from getting COVID as well. Um, other themes, so that was the mental health stuff that I was thinking about. Um, stuff, substance use was interesting because we had done also done a very small survey among Asian MSM in our community about their use. And similarly, we were seeing um, either less or no use or the same use um, during the early, early months of the pandemic, um, which makes sense because especially as gay men um, who they would be using within either in gay clubs, um, or circuit parties, or if they were PMPing and using with sex, uh, a lot of gay men, again, were, as we saw in the data, um, were having less sex or um, limiting how much they were doing. Um, prep, the um, prep use was a one big thing that I was thinking about because um, because I like to see, it was interesting to see the differences between Vancouver and Toronto, whereas, as mentioned, Toronto um, prep is not covered um, from the province. And so cost insurance is already a big barrier, even before the pandemic. Um, so I could see why there is an increase, why more people in Toronto stopped using PrEP completely. Because on top of that, of having less sex, but they're just saving money. Whereas if it was um, covered, you could, it wouldn't be a big deal to continue using it. Um, so that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. And also culturally, um, like as an Asian person, like I grew up, um, always having to save money. My parents were refugees. So they always taught me to save, like just save every little penny. So money is such a big barrier when it comes to prep, I find. Um, I also had quest, uh, I had an interesting question about the prep use as well, because when guys decided to stop or change their use, I wonder how many consulted their doctors first or whether they switched on their own um, and then whether they knew to test for to get their HIV test again if they wanted to restart if they stopped completely so that one's one thing I'd be interested to know more and hear about and it would also speak to whether how autonomous gay men might be um, to feel like or empowered to feel that they can do these choices on their own but have the enough um of the resources or have enough of the access to testing to be able to do it the, for themselves without having to really consult if they understood uh, more about how important it is to switch or what do they need to do to switch their prep use um and then of course lastly about anti-asian racism um, definitely was such a big stressor for many folks in my community during this time. Um, it just, uh, racism has always been there, but that's definitely the impact of COVID has increased that greatly. And so like, just, I, I would hear it more commonly among Asian, my community members being scared of walking, of going out or always having to just be on guard really whenever they're out and in hearing more instances of like violent encounters um or just being like singled out even having to think about should i wear my mask out or not at the beginning it was questionable just because we there is a fear of being singled out for wearing a mask um and then or even just coughing or sneezing in public any little thing but it could affect or be dangerous for ourselves. Um, and I did, I have heard about increased um, or unprovoked message, 
racist messages on Grindr for gay men. Um, sexual racism was already experienced on Grindr, um, but we'd, we'd still see it perpetuated more through the pandemic. Um, those were my initial thoughts on what I, what I saw from the data. Um, is there anything else we need? That's great, Ren. Thank you so much. Um, I am uh, going to turn it over to uh, Daniel in case he has any any additional comments or or um, anything he wants to add to kind of like respond to some of the broader questions you raised, and then we'll take it to audience Q and A. We've got uh, at least one question. If anybody else has any questions that have kind of been percolating as you've watched these presentations or as you've been listening to uh, to Ryan share the community perspective, please enter it in the Q and A. Thanks so much, China. Th thanks, Ryan, for so many great um, comments. It opens up a, a whole bunch of threads that we could follow. Um, I guess a few things quickly. The the um, the comment you had about uh, prep decision making is a really interesting one. Um, I and Cornell or or uh, Jordan might have some comments on that. Um, but I, we are, are exploring that specific question in terms of how those decisions were made. Perhaps not surprisingly, some people seem to consult with their doctors and some made these decisions completely in the absence of consultation. Uh, we also saw decisions about switching to daily use to on-demand use in the context of the pandemic. Um, likely, uh, and our qualitative interview spoke to this for the the reasons that you're talking about um, in terms of uh, cost savings. Um, but we, so we have this question about how on-demand prep decision-making is actually happening. Um, related work um, that we've been doing on prep use really underscores this theme of certainly there are multiple barriers to prep, um, but in Ontario, we see cost emerge um, uh, most as the most pronounced barrier um, uh, very consistently across multiple studies. Um, so I think that, that um, that's not to minimize the, the other really significant barriers to access, um, but uh, continually we see PrEP emerge um, over years, and this includes pre-COVID um, research. But thanks so much, um, Ryan. And uh, I'd love to just open it up to the panel and, and any other questions that people have. Yeah, I'll jump in uh, just on the question about um, whether or how we can identify whether or not participants switched from uh, daily use to on-demand use. So as I mentioned, I'm leading a study with the CTN now, um, which is looking at that. And I'm working with our data analysts now to really identify these using our administrative data because as I mentioned in BC, we do have um, publicly funded PrEP, so we can look at um, these prescriptions and how they're distributed. And the bottom line is that it, it is very difficult to identify um, if these individuals uh, switched from on-demand or um, from daily to on-demand use. And I think that a benefit is that we do have our questionnaire data um, from Engage, which specifically asks these questions, but specifically using just administrative data alone, it's very difficult to look at these. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just like add something really quickly as well. Um, thanks, Daniel and Jordan, for talking about the on-demand piece. I think I would say generally that um, the participants that we interviewed were actually quite proactive in terms of like how they approached um, prep use. So for some folks, it was switching from daily to, to on demand. Um, in some cases, it was actually educating their healthcare provider about prep to, to start prep in the first place. Um, and there was one interview that I recall from the second round of interviews where the participants uh, started or like sought out prep um, in, in anticipation for, in anticipation, in anticipation to start having sex. And he was kind of like, well, I'm not planning on doing anything just yet, but I do want to have it on hand if and when um, I do decide to start having sex with, with partners. So I do think uh, DBM, generally speaking, are actually uh, quite adept in kind of like navigating what, um, I don't know, I guess HIV prevention looks like for, for their particular um, practice. And just a very brief note, since you mentioned 
sexual racism during COVID. I also, um, I interviewed someone in Toronto during the second round who had expressed some concern where he was worried that um, as a man of color, um, if you were to test, he, he was worried that like per potentially being COVID positive might be another kind of like vessel for experiencing um, sexual racism online, that people use that as the excuse that they don't want to engage um, with him as far as any kind of sexual interactions are concerned. It's not something that was like common per se across the interviews, but I, but I do think it's something for sure that we need to keep our eye on. So our question from the chat was also related to PrEP, and I think that we have um, kind of uh, addressed it already in some of the discussions we've already been having about PrEP. The, the question was related to some of the differences between um, the three sites and how um, PrEP is covered in, in Vancouver, um, but, but isn't covered in, uh, in Ontario and, um, or in Quebec. And it does sound from what you all have been saying that, that price uh, cost of PrEP is a significant barrier. Um, is there anything more that, that any of you would like to add to, to this, this um, issue, this topic? Yeah, I can just add a little bit to this question topic. Um, so as I, I think we talked about, I, we, we believe that um, PrEP um, funding is a really big barrier for accessibility. And this also relates to where you can access PrEP if um, accessibility is low as well. And so I, I just pulled up a graph on my screen um, from the BCCFE. Um, where we looked at um, from when PrEP was implemented, our pr public programs implemented in January 2018, and there are, were under 50 new enrollees per month. Um, however, by June 2019, we had over 45,000 new enrollees a month, um, and the BC CFE uh, administers all public ac accessible PrEP, so we can really have a good estimate of these. So this, I think this um, finding and result really shows the importance of public, public funding for PrEP and accessibility. Thanks, Jordan, that's great. Um, we've got one more question. Um, we've got a little bit more time. We have a question from Ben. Um, looking ahead, what are some of the key takeaways from this work to improve the health and well-being, well-being of our communities as the COVID-19 pandemic persists? Um, I, I would love for like each of the panelists to take a minute and answer this, but like, if it's okay with Milada, maybe we'll start with you since you haven't had a, a chance to talk. <laughs> Um, sure. So I think the first thing that strikes me with this question, um, the key takeaway uh, is really just the need for more information. And that's that's kind of where we are at this point, especially with the serology project um, in kind of the pipeline of, you know, knowledge creation and research to policy and implementation and change um, in terms of for serology, what risk factors really, um, you know, maybe are more concentrated in GBM versus the general population. We don't even know if the general population versus GBM have different risk factors to COVID-19. So for us, a uh, key takeaway is really to, to get started and figure out, um, you know, is there a difference between how um, COVID-19 and COVID-19 risk factors affect GBM uh, and we just want to really start amassing this base of, you know, knowledge and information to direct research, first of all. That was everything. I guess I could add something too. Um, when thinking about what we could do in our work to or improve the health and well-being of our communities, um, really, the we need to really take more advantage of like it's like it's great to see that there is more now, but um, taking more, doing more with telehealth and online healthcare. Um, I think having that has for like for some people has made it a lot easier to access healthcare to reach a doctor. Um, however, we still need to have that uh, a lot of LGBTQ 
competent doctors as well who are familiar with that culture um, so that we can refer our community members to those doctors as well who need it. A lot of um, MSM rely on like sexual health clinics and walk-ins, but like there's so much greater advantages to be able to have a regular doctor to see instead of just only for PrEP at the PrEP clinic, they would, could be addressing all these other health matters at the same time. Thanks so much for highlighting that, Ryan. It's it's certainly a really important theme for us as we're thinking about um, what we're learning about which services people were able to continue to access and where there were barriers. Um, so that that eye to the future of uh, HIV and STI testing and mental health and other um, other uh, virtual care is is really um, uh, an important piece of our work moving forward. Um, and I think the work also really underscores what what the community already knows, which is the structural drivers that exacerbate health inequities for our communities. So I think that's that's where our team is really passionate about moving this work forward. How, how do we learn from this experience to support people who were most negatively impacted um, by the pandemic, um, which, which uh, includes the kind of broader social and structural drivers that, that many of the panelists have spoken to. Any other final thoughts? I'll just say if people are interested in this data, if there's ways that we can make it useful for your agencies, if there's questions that this is part of a big cohort study. So we're always looking to try to make these data available and relevant for, for our communities. So please do um, reach out. We'd love, we'd love to connect about it. All right, well, that is a perfect closing. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you um, to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Um, we are uh, just about over, we're just a little bit over time. Um, so hopefully that's okay, but um, thank you so much. There's an evaluation form if you scroll down somewhere, I think. And um, I hope that you enjoyed Summit. I believe we're, we're one of the last sessions. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for staying with us. <laughs> Thank you, Shana. <laughs> Shana, thanks. Our moderator. <laughs>